welcome everybody. Welcome to, to this webinar on um, acid soil, um, soil acidity in, in, in Africa, where we would like to share some work that's been done by um, scientists in um, the CGIAR, um, scientists who are supporting the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative. Um, we want to share this work with you today. Um, and we You can get some insights from the work. My name is Barbara Muzata, and I am the communications lead from SIAT, but scientists who are supporting work within the Excellence in Agronomy. With that, I will let um hand over to, to Jordan and um ask him to introduce himself as well as um the work that will be shared today. Over to you, Jordan. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan Chamberlain. I'm an economist with CIMIT based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I, I seem to be having a, a bit of a glitchy connection. Can I just confirm that other people are hearing me? We can hear you. Okay. And because I can't control the slides, I'm going to ask someone to, to advance. So, so, so maybe we, we go ahead and do that. Um, I think so. Barbara's already gone over the structure of the day or uh, the, the hour, <laughs> not be here all day, I think. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I mean, just to start us off, I'm gonna try to keep myself as close to 10 minutes as possible. So this is you know necessarily very brief and we'll just touch on some of the, the big picture um, takeaways, we'll certainly not go into all the details of the work that we've been doing in the Gaia project, um, but we'll hopefully convince you that there's some interesting work there that we've been generating some, some important um, uh, public goods in the form of knowledge products, one of which we'll, we'll be looking at with, with Joan, and, and we'll also try to articulate how we're moving from the work that we're doing as a project, right, um, into this kind of broader infrastructure of excellence in agronomy to address uh, uh, soil acidity and, and other kind of uh, agronomy issues in an integrated way, in a more sustainable way that, that kind of lives beyond project boundaries as well. So that's kind of the, the story arc. Um, but to begin with, I'd like to just, um, uh, yeah, maybe orient you towards the, the Gaia project that I'll be kind of focusing on results um, that we've generated so far and kind of where we're going and uh, you know kind of what, what's happening in terms of the uh, the work that we're doing and, and how that's that's feeding into this broader agenda. So to begin with the Gaia project really emerged in response to this context where on the one hand you've got soil acidity that's kind of resurging um, re-emerging back uh, on, on strategic policy agendas, uh, coming up again and again in discussions about how to get agriculture going. Um, and at the same time, uh, many countries in the region uh, were starting to uh, develop plans for large-scale investments and liming campaigns and, and other um, you know, concerted efforts to kind of address some of these constraints. At the same time, within the region as a whole, we've got fairly limited lime market developments, right? So limited value chains, in some cases, they're pretty much non-existent. Um, and, and also across the region, uh, generically, uh, you know, the, the, recommend the agronomic recommendations coming through extension systems for soil acidity were, if, if, if anything, were, were very uh, and, and remain very, very generic. And so not tailored to kind of specific conditions or the heterogeneity within uh, acidic areas. And so we were kind of responding to that context by asking kind of one set of overarching questions, which we might phrase as, can data-driven, spatially explicit assessments of the returns on investment in Lyme or, or other means of, of addressing soil acidity, improve the investment decision-making of a number of different actors operating at different scales. So farmers to begin with, the private sector or people um, you know, uh, that, that we would like to um, invest in developing value chains and governments. Um, so we're trying to be relevant to all those different use cases. 
So work within the project is kind of, uh, there's two tiers of activity. So we've got some, some modeling work that looks at uh, all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And then we've got deeper dives into uh, a number of countries in, in East Africa. So Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Tanzania, where we've got um, uh, agronomic trials um, and, and other kind of field-based activities. And we've got deep partnerships with uh, national institutions in each of these places for, for policy engagement, as well as uh, the, the co-development of, of research there. So what's different about this project? Three things. First of all, it's spatially explicit. Uh, even in its basic question, how do we deliver site-specific solutions at scale um, across heterogeneous landscapes? Um, second, it iterates between geospatial modeling and field-level trials in ways that hopefully you'll get uh, a taste of. And three, it integrates agronomic, soil science, and economic perspectives from the beginning, rather than the standard way of doing agronomy projects where you develop a technology, roll it out, and then bring an economist to try to answer the question about why farmers aren't adopting when you think they should. So we're trying to get all those perspectives uh, uh, together from the beginning. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, as a starting point, I'm, I'm kind of going to one of the big picture sets of takeaways um, from work that is summarized very nicely in a paper that Joan has, has led and is in review right now. Um, please contact us if, if you want to if you want to see a, a preprint of that. Otherwise, uh, very soon, I hope to, to share the link. But what we tried to do is, first of all, characterize the magnitude and distribution of the pro of the at soil acidity problem at scale for for the region as a whole. And the map on the left shows um, kind of, you know, one of the outcomes, high level outcomes of, of that, that modeling work, which is an estimate of the crop yield losses across the entire portfolio of crop production, right? Um, so I think there are 42 crops in total that, that, we're, that we're kind of tracking. And it's saying that um, because of unaddressed soil acidity issues, this is the amount of yield that we think was foregone, that we did not get because of unaddressed um, uh, soil acidity constraints. And the other way of looking at that is, is by calculating the value of that foregone production. And the table on the right kind of shows many of the uh, baseline results from that modeling work. I'm only going to ask you to look at one number in particular, because there's a lot to look at there. Next, uh, if you can tap, then I think it's going to highlight that number in the bottom right corner. Uh, John, please click if you could, or whoever's driving, just click, click. <laughs> Sorry. So this is $6 billion of, of production that was not realized because of unaddressed soil acidity constraints. So if you click again, uh, from the same modeling work, we estimate that to, to, to recapture or recoup that, that lost, uh, production would take an estimated 22 million metric tons of lime to neutralize the acidity that's associated with those foregone uh, production um, values. So the question is, where is that lime going to come from? How is it going to be distributed? And for whom is there a value proposition uh, under, under which it makes sense to invest in lime? And again, we're looking at, at, these, at a number of different perspectives there. Next slide, please. And so as a starting point, one of the, um, in some ways, very basic um, conclusions, but, but super important kind of guidelines for how you start to prioritize investments has to do with targeting. And we know that spatial targeting matters. We'll get into other ways of targeting as well. But rather than just showing a map of soil pH and say, we're going to aim at every place below 5.5 uh, pH, which is a kind of standard targeting metric that all of us have seen in, in presentations in the region, um, that's a good starting point. But it obscures a lot of the heterogeneity in conditions under which soil acidity manifests itself. And so I'm not going to unpack this fully because it is a complicated situation. But I will show one very salient dimension of that uh, heterogeneity that's kind of lost when all you look at is pH. And so that's uh, exchangeable acidity. So the graph on the left is showing a very large number of soil samples from across the region. And while we do see that low pH is associated with higher exchangeable acidity, as we would expect, it's an imperfect relationship. And so what that means is that a lot of nominally 
acidic areas by a pH measure have very different underlying soil acidity complex characteristics, right? If you click, um, so in, in these low pH areas with, click please, sorry. Yeah, thanks. So in areas with high exchangeable acidity, uh, lime is pretty much the only lever you have to pull, right? So in these areas, we've got problems with root formation. So you've got these kind of mechanical constraints to the uptake of nutrients and lime is, is kind of the only option that you've got. It may or may not be profitable in different areas, depending on what your input output price ratio is, but it's kind of the only agronomic solution you have. On the other hand, in areas with low exchangeable acidity, the nutrient uh, availability constraints associated with, with low pH can be addressed in other ways. And so this is kind of the leaky pipe analogy is often brought out in situations like this where you've got choices. You can either plug the holes or you can increase the throughput of, the, of whatever you're moving through that pipe. And so in the case of soil acidity, we could treat uh, the underlying issue with lime, but it may be cheaper in many areas, maybe more cost effective to address some of the nutrient availability constraints by, for example, supplementation with P well above recommended levels. You could use uh, organic matter or other kinds of integrated soil fertility management uh, strategies there. Um, so targeting matters in, in, in a different way than we're often used to. Now, in our trials data, we see a lot of heterogeneity in response. And again, unpacking all of that is beyond the scope of what we can do right now. But we do see that a lot of that heterogeneity does seem to map on to this story about looking at different levels of exchangeable acidity. Um, and so this is just a hint. At, uh, you can click again, please. Um, uh, so, so some of that variability is associated, uh, in, in fact, with uh, differences in exchangeable acidity. Next slide, please. In any case, even where we have large agronomic responses to lime applications, it's not always profitable for farmers. We know that. That's a big part of why liming, um, you know, lime value chains have not taken off in many areas. And so the biggest component by far is the delivered cost of lime. So even at these very moderate recommended application rates of one, one and a half, two tons per hectare, that's a lot of lime to move from uh, a crusher location to a farm if the farm is not very near. And so uh, kind of figuring out what those prices look like over heterogeneous, uh, you know, landscapes is a big part of kind of the machinery that we put together. So just some, some flavors of that. So on the left, we can kind of take the current state of infrastructure and model the delivered price of lime based on the location of current crushing facilities. But then we can also start to ask, well, what if we were to, for example, recruit cement factories, which are working with the same raw materials and include them in kind of lime production value chains? How would that change the delivered cost of lime? We could go even further, uh, panel C on the right. I think we've got a delay. Okay. Um, I'm the host now. So if we, can we go back to presentation mode? Great, thanks. And then the next slide. in which all this comes together in, in modeling work. And again, there, there are different ways that we're kind of looking at this at different scales and, and where we've got more data, we're kind of um, you know able to say something with more granularity. But one of the questions that we're trying to respond to is this question that governments in particular have is, okay, we know we have a, a, a soil acidity problem. How profitable is liming, right? If we wanted to roll out a lime campaign or we wanted to build a market, 
what's the value proposition there? Where do we think Liming would be profitable given you know, the integration of these agronomic and economic factors? And the answer, not surprisingly, depends on where you are, but it also depends on the assumptions that we're using. And so I'm gonna try to try to make that apparent in these next few slides. So using kind of um, an assumption that, that we can deliver uh, lime at $100 a ton, which is a good starting point, um, you know, that's roughly in line with, with, with actual costs. And assuming that, that the farmers that we're providing lime to are getting average yields, right? So this is, you know, roughly two tons per hectare in maize and, you know, similar kind of levels of productivity in, in other crops. Well, the situation doesn't look super great, right? There's not a whole lot of areas where we think that there's an a priori basis for building a lime market on the basis of those profits. Um, it, as you can see in the map on the left, that's even including when we, or that's even considering um, when we kind of account for the fact that Lime not only pays you a dividend in the first year, the year of investment, but gives you these kind of lagged effects uh, that kind of depend on, on how much Lime you're applying, but can last from two to four years, right? And so the difference between the panel on the left is that we're only looking at the first year's profit and the panel on the right is looking at this at this um, you know, stream of returns to an investment that you make in year one, but which is paying uh, dividends in terms of higher production in a number of years. So again, under these baseline conditions, the assumptions that we're making, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot of scope in, in the countries that we're focused on in East Africa, for example, um, where we would think that there's a line market. However, next slide, please. This is really highly, uh, contingent on the on the assumptions that we're, we're bringing into this calculation. Next slide, please. So if we move from current prices and current yields, sorry, you've gone to, <laughs> I think there's a, a lag in the, in the system. Let's just go back one and I'll just, I'll, I'll go to kind of where we're ending up. Nope, the other way. One more. Just here. So, if we start to vary some of those assumptions, for example, if we are able to lower lime prices, the delivered price cost of lime to a farmer by 25, or by uh, improving value chain efficiencies, by uh, achieving economies of scale with greater investment in, in value chain uh, markets, sorry, in lime markets and the value chains that kind of um, you know, constitute them, you find a big difference. And uh, sorry, next slide, please. We should also see the impacts of doubling yields, which make the picture look much, much favorable from a marketing perspective. So the takeaway is this. Um, there's a few points to take away from this, is that you're, the, the, the guidance that we're able to give to countries or to the private sector about where to invest in building live markets are highly dependent on the kind of assumptions that go along with it. We really need to raise productivity in these systems. And one of the, one of the takeaways from this analysis is that Lyme by itself is not a sufficient uh, solution. We, we really need to accompany Lyme by, by better, um, better agronomy, um, you know, better inputs, fertilizer, best practices, et cetera, et cetera, to raise the baseline productivity. And that in turn will raise the returns to a Liming investment. The other way to think about this is that within any given system, you've got a distribution of productivity, right? So you can think about, a, you know, your, your typical very small farm that's getting two tons or even less per hectare. It's got a lot of things going on, many limiting factors there versus a, a bigger, more capitalized farmer that's getting five tons per hectare. Well, lime is going to be a better investment, even under the same market conditions, same farm gate price ratios for the farmer who's more productive. And so it does raise issues about targeting, um, not only spatial targeting, but targeting these investments to, to farmers who will receive a higher return on those, on those investments that we're asking them to make. Next slide, please. Next. Sorry for the lags here. Okay, so a lot of what we've been doing so far is, is assembling uh, kind of public goods, information products that enable decision-making at different scales. 
So Joan is going to walk us through the asset soil dashboard, which you know is is capturing a lot of the the data and and kind of guidance that we we've, we've been assembling so far. It's also where we're kind of providing access to many of the scientific outputs. There's a profitability explorer to kind of um, you know enable uh, people to kind of validate some or test their assumptions about profitability conditions. Uh, I think you're going to see that in just a second. The big emphasis for our project has been on on, a, on uh, getting all of our analytical resources as fair data assets that can be used within excellence in agronomy, but but are accessible by the broader set of, of people that we'd like to make this information available to, along with reproducible workflows to kind of get mileage out of those data. Next slide, please. And so here, I just wanted to highlight because of time, I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but you know, um, there, there are many ongoing research questions here. So we've got uh, some, some work uh, teasing out the, the joint economics of lime and fertilizer, right? So, so applying lime can change your, your uh, fertilizer use efficiency, which in turn changes profitability and vice versa. So we've got some new work in that space. We're very excited about and think it's very relevant to the kinds of guidance that we're able to, to supply to farmers in different areas. Uh, another area of work is looking at um, subsoil acidity, which is um, most of the work in this space has been focused on topsoil acidity. So we're kind of looking at that, that other component. Uh, a third area of work is looking at um, trying to, to develop some, some new primary evidence around uh, residual liming effects. So, so the, these lagged effects in time and how they vary by soil type and management and other factors. And then finally, a fourth uh, set of very interesting questions has to do with validating our assumptions about potential demand by resource constrained farmers. So for example, we've got some experimental work on the price elasticity of demand that can inform pricing policy around Lyme in different areas where markets haven't yet been developed. Next slide, please. I, sorry for all the hiccups here. Okay, this is this is the last slide. So I just wanted to close on how Gaia as a project is transitioning over the next year and a half. So between now and the end of 2025, we'll continue uh, with many of the research components, but we're also kind of feeding in to, to excellence in agronomy is a, is a bigger and more sustainable longer term platform for, for organizing these, these resources. So there's three ways that we're doing that. One is through um, informing advisory design and scaling efforts in particular instances. And so as an example of that, uh, as one of the excellence in agronomy use cases, we're working with the Farm to Market Alliance in Tanzania to guide their work, but also to use that as an opportunity to collect data to validate some of our modeling work and to uh, collect better data on, on prices to, to understand what some of these trade-offs are with, with different uh, agronomic levers that are available in different areas. A second area is the integration of assets. So all the data we've collected or, or have produced, uh, the workflows that kind of you know, add value to that data uh, and generate insights, uh, the tools and dashboards, and you'll see an example of that, as well as kind of the how-to, how do you set up something like Gaia in a new geography that's interested in, in better framing responses to soil acidity. All of that is being integrated into uh, excellence in agronomy. And I think uh, Job will touch on that. And then finally, is a way to consolidate all the lessons that we've learned over the past few years um, within excellence in agronomy to make that available. So for example, to answer questions like how do 
How do we rapidly target agronomic R&D to inform scaling efforts in complex geographies? So when a new country comes along. And uh, uh, another question might be, where are agronomic solutions both technically efficient as well as economically feasible investments for farmers? So that's this kind of integrated um, you know, set of, of uh, disciplinary and methodological approaches that, that we've got in our work. That's the end of my presentation. I'll turn it over to um, Joao now and apologies for the technical glitches. Over to you. You can, you can share the dashboard, sure. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jordan. Sorry, I was muted. So, João here, uh, talking from uh, from Lusaka. Uh, I'm a scientist based with CIMIT in, in Arane. And I'll just guide you briefly through the public goods that Jordan was mentioning in his, in his presentation. So, just without further ado, let me share my screen. Can you confirm that you can see it? Yes. Cool. Okay. So... Yeah, just briefly, as I mentioned, uh, we assembled, I mean, all our, uh, I mean, part of our data, the spatial data and part of the agronomy data. And it's basically, it is online, well, it's simply a website, online dashboard, the way you want to call it. I would love to discuss, of course, all the scientific, all the science behind all the estimations and data generation, etc. But unfortunately, that's not the focus, I mean, for these five minutes that I have to showcase these, um, well, this website, this dashboard and the, the associated data, data with it. But anyhow, do reach out if you want to discuss that um, more in depth. So as part of this, of this platform, we have two sets of uh, decision support tools, let's say. Uh, one, as Jordan was mentioning, really archives all the spatial data at sub-Saharan Africa level uh, that we have generated, and I'll guide you through it in a moment. And the other one uh, compiles basically summary, um, well, summary data from the from different agronomy trials we have conducted in different sites in East Africa. Uh, and we develop a, a, a simple profitability explorer uh, in order that for the user to actually assess under given price um, assumptions, the profitability of different responses and the investment in, in Lime, essentially. So in going to the first one, uh, the spatial data, so you can see on top here a tab indicating exactly that. So if you click on the spatial data, that's basically what it, what it, what it shows. It shows you a map of, 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 of Sub-Saharan Africa, then with different layers, um, we, that contain, of course, different data and different information. So when you actually navigate through these, you can find information from four thematic areas, if I can put it this way. Um, so one is, of course, the, the soil property layers that basically power all the exempt spatial analysis that Jordan mentioned. And that's what you can see here. So number one is pH. Number two is the exchangeable acidity that Jordan also mentioned. And then the number three is a measure of your buffering capacity, the effective cation exchange capacity. So in addition to that, we also made available basically the lime requirement layers. So these are estimated from the soil properties and give you an indication for different crop types, what would be potential lime requirements to actually address um, soil acidity in this crop by, uh, well, geography combinations essentially. So, and that's what you, are, what you are seeing now. And then the third building block is basically an estimate of the yield loss that you can expect um, due to soil acidity across across the continent. And then the last one is essentially the profitability associated with uh, with those investments. Sorry. I mean, I'm just clicking the... The downloads, okay, it's nice to look into these maps, but also the goal of these was to make the data available. So... Let's say if you want to know what is the cropland area or the millions of people affected by soil acidity, can you actually extract that from here? And the answer is yes. So you, let's just go here to the soil properties. You can just download this data and you get essentially these, well, this dialog box. And you have two options to actually download the data. You can download it as an Excel file with descriptive statistics for given admin levels, or you can actually download directly the raster data and 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 run with it in your uh, in your data analytics workflows and pipelines, essentially. So just as an example that I would give you, so in Excel, let's go to Excel. We are interested to get data for Ethiopia. So we can select Ethiopia. Before downloading, we do ask you to agree with the, with a the Creative Commons license that you can get information about. But anyways, the data is publicly available and openly available. And then essentially we can just download the data. 
going quickly through this file. So this is Excel format, essentially. It gives you in, in this first step some metadata. So you see the country, the province, and the zone. So it's really focusing on admin levels. And then it gives you two chunks of data. So these four, um, yeah, these four variables, let's say, give you the cropland area in hectares, actually, that are in those quadrants that Jordan was, that Jordan was mentioning earlier. So low, uh, the, and those quadrants that, that segment the pH and the exchangeable acidity relationship, essentially. So, and we have the same information available in terms of the million, um, the million of people actually that would be in each of those, in each of those quadrants. Now, again, this is how the data looks like. I mean, I, I, I won't go beyond that, but you can just see that for each of these admin units, you can get, get information then on the cropland in each of those quadrants. So, you know, with low pH and high, uh, high exchangeable acidity, low exchangeable acidity, and so forth. And then the same when it comes to the, um, well, to the rural population that, that is potentially affected. So I will stop here when it comes to the spatial data. Um, I hope this gives you a glimpse, I mean, even if in a nutshell, of what type of information you can find here. And of course, feel free to explore this further yourself and to reach out if you, if you have specific demands about how to visualize data or how to generate data. Um, or if you have queries, of course, on the science that powers all the data that has been that, that is that, that is being made available through this platform. Now, just briefly, I will move to the agronomy data. So that's the other um, sort of tab that you can see on top of the of the website here. And essentially, what this does is basically summarizes the yield response to Lyme um, for about I mean 150 trials that we conducted in about eight sites in East Africa. So we need two sites in Ethiopia, uh, two sites in Tanzania, and three sites in in Rwanda. So and again, just very briefly, let's say we are interested in knowing the yield response to Lyme in in the southern islands of Tanzania. So this would be in Bozi. We are interested to have this for maize. So this is the crops we tested. And essentially, that's what you can see then in this, in this panel. It shows you in the x-axis the Lyme application rate and the y-axis the yield response that you can expect to that application rate. So that's the response per se. Now, of course, I mean, you can see the colors on the back and that gives you a first, a first cut of potential profitability for these different lime rates. And let's say we assume a, um, a maize price of $200 a hectare that you can play with or $210 a hectare and $55, um, $55 per ton of lime. And you see that nearly, I mean, up to six tons, you can expect some profitable investment in liming. But let's say you double actually the lime price to about the 100 tons, the, the $100 per ton that Jordan was mentioning. And you can clearly see that dye application rates will never be profitable in these under these conditions. So these are the types of things that you can actually explore in uh, in here. In, in addition to that, another way to actually visualize the data is what we call the net revenue and net present value. And that's really a measure of profitability that we are that, that, are, that we are providing you here. So this, again, in the x-axis is the Lyme application rate. In the y-axis is actually the profitability that you can get from that investment, the US dollars per hectare that you can expect to get. Then the green line indicates you the first year profit and the dashed black line indicates you basically I mean, a multi-year profit, considering what we call the net present value, that considers basically residual, effect, uh, residual effects from liming beyond the year of application. And again, you can play again with prices here and see how these things change with lime price. I mean, you see, you see the flavor. And again, I would invite you to actually um, play with the tool and again, reach out if you have questions or any feedback for us to consider. Just to mention, as very briefly, lastly, you can download this data. So that's, again under a Creative Commons license. You can agree to it and download it. And that's essentially, in this table, provides you then per site, per lime rate, and per crop, then the estimated yield response that you can actually expect. So basically the averages that and some measure of soil properties that basically you, you can expect for each of these of these sites. Again, we are still refining these, but uh, but again, you, you, you see the flavor and you see which kind of information will be made available as a first. Um, as a first direct outcome, and down the line, we'll also publicize all the open, all the individual farm data um, and soil data, basically that that powers the statistical analysis, essentially. And well, yeah. Without further ado, um, I thank you for your attention, and um, I will leave it here. So, yeah, over to you, Barbara, and to to Job to to take us off. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. I will share now. Um...
job. Um, Good. can you yeah. run? With them? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Is my yes, sound coming? Okay? Excellent. Good. Excellent. Yeah. Um, we we have had the excellent work that the Gaia project has um been doing, and Jordan mentioned that this work will be linked or uh, connected to the excellence in agronomy as we, we move forward. And um, just for your information, the excellence in agronomy is an initiative of the CGIR. It is multi-center uh, initiative with the aim of delivering an increase in productivity and quality per unit of input, what we have called agronomic gain, and some of the aspects that um, the colleagues were already mentioning uh, in their talk. And uh, the, there are four areas of work that we are focusing on. One of them is facilitating the delivery of agronomy at scale solutions. The um, soil acidity aspects that have been discussed so far is only one of those solutions. And excellence in agronomy is working at a number of uh, issues that affect agronomy. The second area is enabling value creation from big data through advanced analytics bringing data sets together and uh, analyzing those in what um, Jordan was talking about as um, uh, spatially explicit. Um, we are also driving the next generation of agronomy at scale innovations by addressing the gaps that we identify as we uh, implement um, other activities. And finally, we are working around making sure that we have nurtured internal efficiencies within the team to maximize on the complementarities that the teams uh, bring together. Um, we can go to the next, let me see if this works. No, uh, Barbara, you can help, yeah. So, so um, the exercise in agronomy has defined what we call the um, agronomic gain. Um, the slides are moving a bit faster, maybe because of a delay. But what I was saying is that um, we have defined uh, what we are calling the agronomic gain, and we have uh, a couple of dimensions for that. There is a yield and profitability uh, that we have been talking about, including also the quality. There is a climate adaptation and risk uh, reduction. There is uh, improvements in soil health, and there is also uh, resource use efficiency. So this is what we are calling the agronomic gain. And these are the type of things that we want to deliver through agronomy at scale solutions. But we are also working uh, under sa, sa, what I call sort of principles. And this is, for example, being a globally organized R&D community because that's where the efficiencies come in. The project like the one we are talking Gaia, connecting it with the excellence in agronomy is building efficiencies in terms of the way we develop solutions. And as you see, there are also a couple of other uh, uh, principles in which we are working, for example, making sure that we are using um, standardized, uh, fair and open data, and we are integrating uh, technological advances in the way we do our work. I'm going to the, the next one. And um, we have discussed one aspect, as I said, but usually in production, the farmers are considering many other variables that determine productivity. There are uh, local conditions uh, like the pH, uh, soil properties. There are also landscape positions that determine productivity. There are resource and domains, history of land management. There are also varied production objectives that farmers have. They grow different crops, sometimes even different varieties. And also the weather uh, is variable, even across seasons, uh, live around across uh, sites. And farmers, are asking several questions. They are asking for their production under their contexts, what nutrients should they apply? How much is really the appropriate quantity? When is the best time to apply? How much is a replacement if there are other sources of nutrients? And what else can improve their crop response uh, in their areas? So these are the type of questions that uh, the farmers would be asking. And amongst them, we also know that where there is a lime application, like what we have been shown, the profitable areas, we know that the lime will interact with the nutrients and changing the levels of availability of such nutrients. So these are the type of uh, uh, issues that the excellence in agronomy is uh, trying to work around to develop solutions for farmers. So to do that, 
the Excellency in Agronomy uh, appreciates that we do need to develop such agronomy at scale solutions. We need to bring data sets together. We need to apply advanced analytics to those data sets. And we need to package those into decision support tools that farmers can use to guide their uh, farm investments. So this is sort of the framework that we are using in the Excellence in Agronomy to be able to come up with spatially explicit recommendations addressing uh, various issues. And especially uh, a lot of work has been going on in regard to the fertilizers. Now, the first aspect is really bringing the data together. And uh, we have uh, generated a framework or a concept that we are applying. First of all, there are tools that the Excellence in Agronomy has developed that are enabling a development or a creation of fair data. Whether that data is in legacy form today or it's new data being collected, there are tools that are enabling the gen generation of fair data. That data is being put together into a data pool to be able to enable a analytics and what I'm calling here the AgWise analytics modeling that is a framework that the Excellence in Agronomy has developed to facilitate generation of recommendations. Um, those recommendations will then be uh, provided as agro advisories. Through this system and talking about the, the data pool, there is already a large amount of data that the team has collected that is helping to answer different types of questions. I hope it's coming. Or maybe there is a delay on that. Yeah, this is what I mean. So far, you can see the type of distribution across the globe of the data sets that the team has put together and the data that is helping to address various issues in the modeling. You can see so far over 800,000 observations it is a growing data set, so it's not static, but it continues to grow as the teams continue to add into that data set. So this is a type of resource that is helping to address various uh, solutions. Using that data uh, that I have shown, we are developing models of crop responses. But in most cases, those models lack data that is related to the rhyme responses. So the kind of investment and the assets that the Gaia team is bringing is going to complement uh, what the Excellence in Agronomy has already been doing in terms of crop response. And if I go to the last uh, points there, the way we see this happening is in two steps. So first of all, there could be a sequential models where a line um, a model is run that helps us to understand the type of nutrients that should be required and the amounts that should be applied. So running the right model and then followed by running a nutrients recommendation model. The other step that we want to do, and once some of the questions that Jordan uh, mentioned are addressed, is to integrate the models based on a line by nutrient or fertilizer interactions. And that way we have a coupled model that integrates not only the nutrients, but also the lime requirements. Um, here, I'm just showing and recapping a little bit of what I've already said to say that the agronomy uh, at scale approach is considering data that is coming from different sources, uh, field trials, maybe current and uh, past trials, and those are built into the crop models. Uh, those are used to develop those spatially explicit type of recommendations and those are taken out into decision support tools by different partners. As we develop the um, uh, validations trials in terms of what is going on, we continue to collect data that help to answer some of the questions that were raised by uh, Jordan, including the interaction of Lyme with nutrients, for example. Um, to, to just uh, wrap up the uh, approach that the exercise in agronomy is using, I wanted to bring in some areas of improving functionality that we see in the models that have already been created. As I mentioned, we have an elaborate um, framework for modeling, and that framework needs to be improved in certain areas. One of the areas is on 
climate responsiveness to improve uh, seasonal weather integrations in the models. Uh, we have already been uh, talking about profitability, so integration of economics, uh, integration of farmer concerns and risks, and the farmer uh, type of inputs, whether they are doing rotations, whether they have manure in their systems, because some of those organic resources also have a liming effect. And we have already seen from the Gaia data that there are some situations that lime may not be the appropriate solution. There might be other solutions that could be coming in place. So we are going to be improving these models to integrate these other aspects that have not been integrated so far. Uh, I wanted to show that based on the models uh, for uh, nutrient recommendations that have been developed in excellence in agronomy, there are a few examples of uh, big success. For example, in Ethiopia, through those models and recommendations, a yield of wheat is increased by 25%, as well as profits among uh, several farmers. Uh, in Tanzania and Nigeria, for cassava, the productivity is increased by 21%, again, uh, being benefits by thousands and thousands of farmers. In Rwanda, based again on such models that have been developed to recommend nutrients, we do see similar yield observed, even when the fertilizer application is reduced by as much as 100 kilograms. So these are some of the good benefits that we see by applying uh, this type of uh, recommendations. And we do see that those benefits will actually even increase much more when the nutrient models that Excellence in Agronomy is using are coupled with the Lyme uh, recommendations that are coming from, from Gaia. So here I just wanted to show you um, a distribution of the uh, global areas where different types of solutions are being worked out uh, in Excellence in Agronomy and with various results that have been observed. I think that is it. Um, I will return the meeting back to um, Barbara. Thanks for that job and team. Um, to our audiences, sorry about the, the glitches. Um, we've, we've come to the Q&A session now. And um, I, I see um, Miriam has has asked a question, um, Jordan, and um, Job. She says we are doing um, a field experiment with silicates in Colombia. Just be careful not to contaminate the soil with heavy metals, um, depending on the source of of, of the silicates. Mm -hmm. And does any of you have um, a comment for that? Um, any any three of you can take the the comment, give feedback. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think what she's responding to is an earlier message in the Q and A from uh, Sam Davies from Flux, who's describing a, a a different treatment that they've been experimenting with. And so, yeah, point well taken. Um, I, I guess that's that's it for my. Yeah, back to you, Barbara. Hi, I'm um, sorry I was talking and um on mute. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to to ask the teams to really use the Q and A function for for more questions. Um, Job and Joe and Jordan are on the line to answer any of your questions. Please use the Q and A function. Um, in, in the meantime, I'll try and um, also unmute some of our audience members who would like to, to ask any questions. Well, maybe while we're waiting for, for more questions or comments, um, just to signal that, yeah, I mean, you know, reach out to us if you're interested in more details about any of this and, and we'll make sure to, I mean, it's work in progress, right? So that there's, there's lots, lots of stuff in the pipeline. And that's true 
you know, more broadly uh, for excellence in agronomy. And I should say many of us in the Gaia team also wear hats in, in, in yeah. EIA. So there's a lot of overlap and, and we're all part of the same family. Um, but so about any aspect of this, um, if, if, if you, you know, have questions later on, feel free to reach out by email and we'll certainly share um, papers and resources as, as they come out. But um, for the soil acidity work from Gaia in particular, um, you know, the keeping track of the uh, the dashboard is 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 a good way to do that. Since anything that we we generate will, will be put onto that onto that uh, website. That's that's great, Jordan. I've allowed um, Gehinde and um, Braden to to talk. They've raised their hands. I I believe they have questions. Please go ahead. We'll start with Kehinde. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning. And uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, it was very fascinating and uh, interesting. So I have three questions. One is for Jordan, and the other one is uh, for... Um, uh, sorry, I missed the name. So the first question is, uh, at what interval is Lyme application should be allowed to be on the field before fertilizer is being applied? That is my first question. Then the second question is uh, almost similar question, but different. At what instance, again, should uh, a farmer is advisable to apply the uh, lime <clears throat> at, uh, at different year? For example, if the farmer applied fertilizer, for example, this season, how long does he have to wait before he applied another lime? Can it take effect for 10 years, five years, two years, or one year? Or can it even take effect within the season? How long is the farmer advised uh, to apply uh, to apply the lime? And uh, my third question for, uh, sorry, I missed the name, the last presenter, the last presenter, sorry. Is John. So, so, okay, yeah, sorry, Mr. Kehara, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, you made mention of Gaia, and uh, based on my experience with Sub-Saharan Africa generally, uh, a lot of farmers often misconcept the use of lime to fertilizer application. So it takes much time to convince an African farmer that lime is different from fertilizer. That is, then my question is, what is Gaia doing precisely in order to ensure that this uh, lime recommendation that is being proposed for African farmers is being available to the farmer in terms of the social acceptability, not the technical part of it. In terms of the social acceptability, what is the guy doing in order to bridge this uh, gap? So that is my third question. Thank you. I think I'm done with my question. Thank you, um, Kehinde. Um, over to you, Joao. I, I note that, um, and, Jed, and Jordan, please take the questions quickly because we've got three yeah. more questions waiting. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Jordan, I, I think you'll have more to say about many of this, so, so please go ahead. Yeah, great. I mean, so the first one was, I mean, how much time, how, how much, in advanced lime should be applied to fertilizer. Then the other one was the reapplication frequency. And the third one, the social acceptability, if I recall well. So I think the first one, uh, I mean, we recommend to apply lime before planting and about a month before planting. The reason is that lime needs to react with water in the soil to actually, I mean, to actually neutralize, you know, exchangeable acidity and actually remove toxicities that you get during the growing season. So we talk about, I mean, about a month in advance would be ideal. But I mean, not I mean, hopefully not below two two weeks before planting. You know, if you want to see benefits within that same growing season. Uh, but again, this is very much also from experiences from elsewhere. You know, not not I don't think we have the data. I mean, you know, I don't think we have the right data sets to have clear evidence from these in in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Regarding the second one, I mean, of course, I mean, as an agronomist, my answer will be it depends, right? I mean, it depends on your soil type. It depends when you apply the lime, which lime you apply how in advance you apply it, if, a good, uh, if there is good rain or not. So it really depends, you know, and I think these residual effects, I mean, yeah, you know, again, I, I am not aware of any data set in Sub-Saharan Africa that really documents them very nicely for different soil types, you know, so I could not tell you that that 
you know, saying, look, in oxy soil in northern Zambia, this would be five years. Whereas if you are in a sandy soil in northern Tanzania, this would be one year. I mean, I cannot tell you that. But knowing a little bit the literature globally, I think the residual effects, again, for lime rates above one ton per hectare might, might go between, I mean, somewhere between third, uh, three years to five years, I would say. That would be my guess, my guess estimate. But again, maybe other colleagues could also comment there. The last one in terms of social accept accept acceptability, I mean, no, we, we are not focusing on that for now. I think, yeah, lime is still not on the market in many of these places. There is hardly any market development, any market, any lime value change in the regions where we work. So I think, yeah, that could be an important consideration as we move that forward, as the, those markets actually develop. But I'm not sure we are there yet. So, um, yeah, I think this would be my my answer. So thank you for uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Barbara, maybe, maybe since we're almost out of time, we we take the last two questions and then try to provide quick answers to them. That's fine. Um, I think Kerubo's hand has been up for for a while now. Kerubo, do you want to go ahead? I've given you permission to talk. Thank you for the opportunity and um, uh, thank you for the session. Uh, I have a question, <clears throat> sorry, that is um, I'm audible. Yes. I have a we question that, you. okay. I have a question that is almost similar to the previous um, attendee. My, I, when it comes to soil productivity, the soil chemistry is a, uh, part of it, but also the soil physics um, is also crucial to towards maintaining the soil fertility. So if I would like to improve the the, the soil strength by adding farmyard manure that is uh, well decomposed, uh, can I apply the lime plus the farmyard manure together, considering the fact that farmyard manure should also be applied prior planting, it's normally recommended uh, two to four weeks, or um, how would you guide on that? If I can uh, respond to you, I think it's, it depends um, because the amount of manure is, is a factor that you need to consider and also the level of acidity that is in that soil. So whereas uh, a manure, for example, would have some liming effect, it will not be such a large liming effect. So it depends on the levels of um, the acidity in the soil, the exchangeable acidity that uh, Jordan was talking about. So perhaps if it's less, then it can probably solve the solution, uh, the problem. If it's more, then probably you need both. So I think it depends. And that's where I think um, the excellence in agronomy wants to work around is spatially explicit, contextualized sort of recommendations. That would be my response, but I don't know whether colleagues want to say anything else. Um, thanks, Job. We, we've come to the top of, of the hour, and, and I would like to encourage those who can stay to stay, but allow those who are out of time to, to drop off. Um, and this is really to maybe allow Brayden. Brayden, can can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Um, if I if you can, that. um, please go ahead and ask your question. Sorry, what was that? I don't hear anything. Uh, Brayden, would you like to ask a question? Hosea, please go ahead and ask your question, Hosea. Mm. 
Okay. I, I don't see any hands raised. Uh... Sorry. So, Jose, I wrote a question in the Q&A. So, can I ask directly? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice presentation and uh, a lot of learnings here. I come from a place in Baringo where we have one of the biggest irrigation schemes. That is Pergera Irrigation Schemes in Marigat sub-county. Uh, we have observed that farmers are now abandoning a lot of their parcels. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them, uh, mainly they are talking of productivity and such. Most of these farmers have been doing tomatoes mm -hmm. and onions for quite a long time. And uh, my my assumption was acidity. So I don't know if there's anything you can say on this, uh, but um, my, my main aim is to, if possible, you can collaborate to take some data from this scheme and see if we can help the people of uh, that irrigation area. I, I can take that one. Um, well, yeah, thanks for your question. I think Jordan also responded in the Q&A actually. And I think of course, the data is publicly available in the, in the website. So I mean, yeah, you can, that would be the, the starting point, right? Just scroll through those maps and see what those spatial predictions of soil properties indicate you. That would be the first consideration. The second one is a more technical one. I mean, I think you talk really about vegetable crops that I assume actually you, uh, I mean, use a lot of fertilizer that might actually lead to acidification effects in the soil. And I think I would caution that because, you know, we are talking about two different types of acidity processes here, right? One is soil acidity, like your intrinsic soil properties driven by leaching of cations in your soil profile. The other one is, of course, another process of acidification that goes with frequent high rates of some types of fertilizers that actually lead, lead to low, I mean, induce low soil pH and lock uh, some nutrients associated in, in, in that process. So, I mean, just watch out, you know, which kind of um, processes are at stake in your case there. And note that, I mean, our analysis refers to the former, you know, so to these soil acidity constraints, you know, not so much to fertilizer induced acidification. So that would be my answer. Yeah, thank you. I think I think the second one is uh, the second part is quite true. We are using a lot, a lot of fertilizers now, and uh, maybe it's a one. It's a uh, it's one of the main causes. What would be the solution to such a case now? Actually, I mean, I, I believe again we have not done any explicit work on that, but I believe um, I mean the recommendation would be actually low low rates of lime. You know that you can actually that you would need actually to to apply to buffer this acidification from the fertilizers you get. And you can calculate those because each fertilizer actually has an, acidific an acidifying effect that uh, that is well known. So basically for uh, for each kilo of that fertilizer that you apply, you can estimate how much lime you need to to counter buffer that. So I think, yeah, there are some technical recommendations on that. I would, I mean, I would not know who in your country, whatever would, would, would do that, but there is literature around, around those acidification effects. So that would be my, my answer, yeah.